on the topic of what did you call me? What did you call me? Matthew chapter 7 beginning in verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 beginning in verse 21 I pose the question what did you call me? If we stand in honor of the reading of God's word and the word of the Lord reads this morning in the King James text, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in to the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Master, we thank you, God, today for your word. We know, God, that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Lord, today quicken this wonderful word in our hearts and in my spirit, that I might deliver it, God, in a way that would do justice, so the people of God might be benefited thereby. This is an important message at this hour, and God, today I just ask that your anointing flow through through me and in me, help me, God, to uh, deliver every word, every thought, every point that you would have me to deliver, God, that we might leave this place knowing we've heard from heaven and not merely from a man, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name, amen, praise God, and amen. You may be seated this morning. I was at a place this week uh, having lunch, and there was a fellow... <coughs> excuse me, that I know, who constantly just loves to preach at people. Every time you see him, he's preaching to somebody. He was sitting across from me, and there was another gentleman sitting not too far from me, and the fellow that loves to preach at people began to talk to the other fellow, and uh, the other fellow began to explain to him, well, I, you know... I'm not really into this whole religion thing. He said, you know, there are so many religions in the world. You don't know uh, what's what. He said, you know, I just think that uh, God's God and, you know, basically every road leads to Rome. And it doesn't matter how you approach God. Whatever way you come, you'll get to him. Whether you're Buddhist, whether you're Hindu, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, it's not important. And of course, I thought to myself, well, you know, that attitude is very common in today's world. There's a movement in the world today to try to meld all religions together and say, well, because there are common aspects to this thing, uh, we have to understand that it doesn't matter how you approach it, it doesn't matter how you believe or what you believe, it all amounts to the same thing anyway. And I wanted, I sat there and I wanted so bad to turn to that young man that was sitting next to me saying all of this and I wanted to turn to him and ask him a question. How would you feel if police officers pulled up behind you one day walking down the street, ordered you to spread your legs and spread your arms out against their automobile and begin to pat you down and the reasoning that they gave you for stopping you and arresting you was, well, we were told that there was a man 
who robbed this other individual down the road a few blocks. Okay, so a man robbed another man down the road, down there a ways. Uh-huh. Yes, sir, and they told me that he was white, six foot four, about 250 pounds with blonde hair and blue eyes. But officer, I'm five foot ten, 180 pounds, and black. <laughs> I don't even begin to fit the description that you're giving. Why then would you stop and arrest me? Well, because it really doesn't matter what description is given. You're a man, aren't you? Amen. You're following what I'm telling you. Today. It doesn't matter. You're a man, aren't you? You're walking the road. You're going in this direction. He said a man robbed him and headed off in this direction. Well, we're all thinking, that. well, that's absurd. That's stupid. Who would do that? Of course who would do that. But when it comes to things of God, we want to believe that we can generalize and everything's going to be okay. If it's got the name God... If it's got the title God attached to it, then that's good enough. As long as we call it religion, then that's good enough. It doesn't matter what the details are. The devil's in the details. You know, we don't we don't care about the details, and all the details do is muck things up. But the truth of the matter today is Jesus Christ came to reveal God to humanity. He came so that we could know what God looked like. He came so we could know how God reacts and how God acts and how God behaves and how God conducts himself. When we look at the man Jesus Christ, we have a clear picture of our God and our Creator. We see the love of God in action. We see God's patience in action as his disciples are wanting to do all kinds of goofy things and wanting to go off in all these crazy directions and you can almost see a smile on the Lord's face as in oh you sons of thunder yes, oh Lord you got an old Peter yes. man I'll tell you y'all come up with some of the dumbest ideas I've ever heard you can just almost hear that lilt in his voice you know, as he wants to laugh but he doesn't quite laugh but we see God in the face of Jesus Christ and there's a reason for this so that we're not arresting every man on the street so that we can find God and not merely find a God or a concept of God there are many in this life who want to teach and preach and believe that all of the many religions of this world lead to the same deity in heaven Therefore, what difference does it make what path we follow or which road we take? Although all roads lead to Rome, they'll tell you. Interestingly enough, however, this very notion is refuted throughout the history of the Hebrew faith and was further decried by the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Throughout the entire Old Testament, the history of the Hebrew faith, you constantly read where God is discounting the existence of any other gods but himself. Amen. Therefore, it, you cannot simply approach the same, well, it don't matter what name you call them, all the names you're, you're talking to say, no, because God said y'all are calling upon Baal, but Baal doesn't exist. Amen. Y'all are calling upon this one, Isis, and Isis doesn't exist. Y'all are calling on that God, and that God does not exist. I'm up here alone. Why did he not simply say, hello, yes, can I help you? That's right, amen. That's right. If it didn't matter how you approached him, if it didn't matter what you called him, why then did God go to such great efforts throughout the Old Testament to over and over again discount the reality of false gods and false images? Why did he do that? 
Why I ask you, did he order his people as they went into the land of Canaan and conquered uh, land after land, city after city? Why did he give his people instruction time and again uh, when they would battle nations that had false concepts of God and false teachings and false idols? Why did he order them, annihilate them? I don't want one of their cows to live. I don't want one of their chickens to live. I don't want one of their children to live. When you uh, go in and conquer that land, I want everything associated with them dead and gone. Well, Lord, that's awful harsh. Why did God say this? Why did God do that? Well, for one thing, because a lot of times the animals were deified. Or they were used in the religious process, in their religious ceremonies, and in their various uh, ordinances. And the Lord said, I don't want anything that has even been associated with these false gods. I don't want anything that's even been associated with these idols to continue to exist. I want everything associated with it gone. You can't leave a single thing because if you leave even a remnant, even a seed, it'll wind up growing up again and before too long some idiot's going to run out and grab that one chicken that survived and say, oh, this is a holy chicken. This chicken was consecrated to Baal. And all of a sudden, you've got a resurgence of the doctrine of Baal. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Yes, amen. You see, God didn't play games. He didn't even begin to suggest that you can approach him any old way you want to approach him. He didn't even begin to suggest that it didn't matter to him by what name you called him. If you look at the title of my message today, I ask the question, what did you call me? Yes, amen. If you look at our primary text this morning, you see that the Lord declares, not everyone who cries unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in. That's interesting. He didn't say, not everyone who cries unto me, Jesus, Jesus. That's right. It's not what he said. He said, not everyone who cries unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in. You see, Lord, in this instance, if you recall, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. Therefore, what he is saying is, not everyone who cries out God. Right. Amen. Not everyone who says I'm acting in the name of God, I'm doing this on behalf of God, not everyone who says this is going to enter in. And if you'll notice in this context, unlike our last message a couple of weeks ago where I talked about when the Lord spoke of the kingdom of God, and that had to do with here on earth, but here in this context he said shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So there's a difference. The kingdom of heaven now being eternity with God. He said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter in. Not everyone who thinks they're talking about God, but don't know who God is. If you remember on the road to Damascus, the apostle Paul at that time called Saul was blinded by a light and he fell from his horse and he looked up and he heard a voice but saw no man and he responded by saying, Who art thou, who? Lord. He was in effect saying, Who are you, God? Because Lord in the Hebrew vernacular is reserved only for God. No one is called Lord outside of God. You don't call any being or any person Lord unless you're speaking of Jehovah God himself. And Paul, uh, Saul at that time asked the question, Who art thou Lord? He didn't even know who he was running around killing people for. Hello now. Yeah. Here he was murdering Christians by the hundreds and he didn't even know who he was serving. 
He didn't even know who he was doing it on behalf of. All of a sudden, he realized that God was stopping him in his tracks and that he had to answer for his actions. And all of a sudden, Saul realized, I don't even know who I'm dealing with. I thought I did, but I don't. Who I thought And the answer came back just as clear as can be. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I got news for you children. When you come against the church of the Most High God, you are not coming against Jehovah God. You're coming against Jesus. Because when the question is posed, who art thou, Lord? The answer didn't come back. I am Jehovah. The answer came back. I am Jesus. Man. Whom thou persecutest. You touch my people. You touch the echo of my eye. You start putting your fingers on God's people and you're poking God right in the eye. And there's nothing more annoying than being poked in the eye. You ever been poked in the eye? By accident? By some, boy, that's about the most annoying thing in the world. Makes you want to slap my trace of silly. Just I don't care who does it or why they do it. You just want to smack them up. So, you know, it's so annoying to be poked in the eye. And that's why God speaks of his people as being the apple of his eye. He said, you see that little glint in my eye? You see that little sparkle in my eye? That's where my people are. That's how close to my heart they are. That's how important they are to me. Why? Because the eyes of the Lord are upon who? The righteous. Amen. God said, my people are never out of my sight. Amen. So when you start picking on my people, baby, you better look behind them. Because big brother daddy is standing right behind them. And if you think you can give them trouble, you better look again. Because like the old, you know, the old story the child used to say, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. You think you're going to give God's people trouble, you better be careful. Because daddy's standing right behind them. And you don't want to mess with him. Amen. You see, this morning, this notion, it doesn't matter how we approach God. It doesn't matter what name we approach God. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about it this morning as I was driving in. And I was contemplating my message. And I was thinking about, as a kid, uh, when you've got a name like Charles, you can be called everything but the kitchen sink. Uh, there are so many little, you know, uh, nicknames and things that go with Charles. Some people call you Charles. Some people call you Chuck. Some people call you Chucky. If you're a junior, then you get called Chuck Junior, Charles Junior, CJ. Uh, I had so many little names that I went by that for the first oh, 12 or 14 years of my life, I didn't know who I was. <sighs> And then my mother had some choice names for me that really confused things because they didn't have nothing to do with the name Charles. You little buzzard, get over here. And, uh, but I thought about it and I said, you know, it's funny, but as you grow and you get older, I remember my Aunt Faith. She's kind of the same way. People call her Faith, people call her Faith, people call her Faithy. And as a young person, they call her Faithy. I remember when she's young, you know, we all called her Faithy. Faithy. Faithy, Faithy. But as she got older, she put off that name. Because it spoke to her of youth. It spoke to her of being a child. And she wasn't a child anymore. And she didn't want to be called Faithy. And God help you to call her that. Because, honey, you needed faith. If you called her Faithy. Well, as I got older, I did the same thing. You know, all of a sudden, Chucky just doesn't appeal as much as it used to. You know, it doesn't sound like a name that a grown-up man wants to be called. So therefore, when I would introduce myself to people and I'd speak to people, I honestly can tell you that I wasn't called Charles by hardly anybody probably the first 14 years of my life. My school teachers, of course you know school teachers, a lot of times they call you Mr. Morrow. 
So they didn't even call me by my first name. But a lot of my family called me Chuck, Chucky, Chuck Jr., CJ, so on and so forth. You little buzzard, you know all of those names. So I thought about it this morning. And I thought about it and I said, well, Lord, what about people that come to you and they're still living in the Old Testament and they want to call you by the name that you were called by in the Old Testament? Mm. What happens then? And the Lord said, you know how you put off the name Chucky and use your name Charles? And everybody you spoke to, you told them, my name is Charles. I had somebody write me an email recently. I guess they saw my name in an article I wrote or something, and they were writing kind of a nasty email, a critical email. And he said something, now listen, Chuck. And I sat there and I thought to myself, buddy, who are you talking to? Yeah. You don't call me Chuck. The only people that I would even begin to allow today to call me Chuck would be people that I'm very close to, family, you know, uh, that have known me since I was a kid, then they can get away with it. But who are you to try to call me Chuck? You can see that my name is Charles. It's not your business to try to change that around and address me by some other little title or name. That's not, you don't do that. That's, that's not respectful for one thing. Right. Am I right? Amen. And I thought, well, what about those who approach you and say, Oh, Jehovah, 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 Jehovah. God said, I'm not called Jehovah anymore. Uh-huh. I no more answer to that than you answer to Chucky. Yes, amen. If you were standing out in the road and a woman came out and yelled, Chucky, Chucky, you, I wouldn't even turn my head. Even though at one time I was called that. Even though at one time my mother would get out in front of the house and call Chucky, Chucky, Chucky. But that's not my name anymore. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? I wouldn't even respond to that. But you let that same person go out in the front of their house and say, Charles, and I'm going to turn around to see if they're not talking to me. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Because that is the name by which I go by today in the here and now. Honey, you can get down on your knees or you can get up on your legs and pray and cry and scream all you want to and call out Jehovah, 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 and Jehovah God is sitting in heaven and saying, I don't know who they're talking to. My name is Jesus. And when you call me by my name, when you call me by the name that I reveal to humanity in the person of my son, then we'll talk. But you're not going to call me by something I used to go by, hello now, by something that I put off when I put on flesh. Amen. The Lord graduated. The New Testament was born. And when the New Testament was born, there was a new name. Isn't it interesting in Scripture how many people, when they experienced new life in Christ, put off their old name and took on a new one? Amen. God did too. When the Old Testament was completed and the New Testament was born, God put on a new name. Now it's interesting, some people get married and instead of taking on their spouse's name, they decide they're going to hyphenate. Well, I'm not Mary Brown, my husband's Brown, but I'm Mary White Brown. So I guess that makes her Mary Tan. My name is Mary White Brown. They hyphenate, right? Well, the interesting thing about the name of Jesus is, the name of Jesus, God didn't entirely put off Jehovah, but he hyphenated it. 
He had done it throughout the entire Old Testament. There were many occasions when he introduced himself or when he presented himself or when he was recognized by the people of Israel as a number of hyphenated names that included the name Jehovah. He was known as Jehovah Shalom, God of Peace. He was known as Jehovah Jireh, God my provider. He was known by a number of hyphenated names. But when he came and introduced himself to humanity in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he hyphenated it and said, Hi, I'm Jehovah your Savior. <laughs> I'm Jehovah God your Savior. And that's what Jesus means. So he didn't just put off the old name. But you know, you don't want to approach somebody who's got a hyphenated name and decide you're going to drop what comes after the hyphen because it's convenient for you. Oh, hi, Mary Brown. Huh? Aren't you Mary White? Oh, I'm Mary Brown White. Huh? You don't just drop what comes after the hyphen because that has become her name. Yes, amen. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That is her name. So you can't just say, well, since he's using a hyphenated name anyway, I'll just call God Jehovah and, you know, close enough. No, Calvary attached Savior yes, to that name. Calvary attached Savior to that name, Jehovah. And Jehovah himself became the Savior. And when that occurred, my friend, you do not have the right, the responsibility, or the goal to approach God and address him as anything other than Jehovah Savior, which is Jesus. My word have mercy. Does it really matter? Does it really does it really matter, Jesus said, not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord. See, there are a lot of people today that call Buddha Lord. There are a lot of people today that call uh, any number of a thousand gods Lord, Vishnu in the Hindu faith. Does it really matter? Well, John 14, 6 and 7 declares, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. My word have mercy. Folks, I don't even have to comment on that. It says what it says, and you'd have to be about half bits not to understand it. Yeah. He said, from this day forward, you have known my father, and you have seen him. Yes, amen. You looked into my face. Yes, and when you looked into my face, you were looking into the eyes of God. Don't yes, you get it? Amen. Don't you get it? From this day forward, you've not only known him, but you have seen him. It sounds to me like a very narrow opening. It sounds to me like there isn't a lot of play, that you can't just come any old way you want to come. The Lord said, no, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He didn't say anything about Buddha. He didn't say anything about Vishnu. He didn't say anything about Muhammad. He didn't say anything about any of these others. He said, I alone am the way. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 11. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, and if you understand uh, the way that Hebrews spoke, the Jewish people spoke in, in New Testament times as well as in Old Testament times, when they would begin a statement with uh, the repetitive verily, verily, that was a way of attaching a exclamation point to that statement. And it was a way of getting your attention. You know, you'd be uh, sitting in the marketplace and a rabbi would be speaking and all of a sudden say verily, verily, and it was just like those commercials on television and you know, everybody stops and listens. Because for somebody to say, verily, verily, that was an attention grabber. That would make you, kind of suck you in and make you listen. Listen to what the Lord thought was so important that he began by saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, 
I am the door of the sheep. Listen, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Yes, amen. Well, don't you know Buddhism is older than Christianity? All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Didn't you know Hinduism is older than Christianity? All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. You hear what I'm telling you? But the sheep did not hear them. Somebody heard them, but not God's sheep. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I told you at Calvary, Jehovah became Jehovah Savior. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You can't take that away from him. To know God is to understand this revelation. In the Old Testament era, the Lord gave to his people Israel a name by which he was to be called. He did this so as to distinguish himself from the gods of the people that lived around Israel. When Israel was helped by God to conquer the land of Canaan, there were a number of instances where they were given orders to completely and utterly destroy their enemies so as not to allow even the slightest remembrance of their idolatry to survive. The truth today, my friend, is this. There is no such thing as merely giving a different name to the same God in heaven. When we apply a different name than that which is revealed to us by God himself, we speak of a different God, or we speak of an idol, if you will. Idolatry is still very much alive and well in the world in which we live today. But listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 6. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost. Remember Jesus said, My sheep know my voice. He said, Others that have come before me are thieves and robbers. He said, But my sheep didn't follow them. My sheep didn't go in that direction. Why? Because they know my voice. Israel was led by a deity, by a God, before the New Testament was born. Amen. And Jesus was saying, you've got to look at this in the context of how the Jews of his day were understanding what he was saying. See, we read it and we try to interpret it in Western yes, amen. thinking. The Lord said, he's speaking to a bunch of Jews. I am the door to the sheep. I'm the door by which the sheep come and go. Israel is looking and saying, we serve the only one true God. Am I right? Yes. yes. And he has led us and kept us. We have been the sheep of his pasture. Isn't that what David said in the Psalms? That we are the sheep of his pasture. Yes. Amen. And all of a sudden you got Jesus standing here saying, I'm the door to the sheep. I'm what protects them from the enemy. I am the good shepherd. I am the one that leads them and guides them and brings them into green pastures. My Lord have mercy. And you got a Jew sitting there quoting the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? That Jew sitting there thinking, no, no, no. Hey, Mr. Man, you got it wrong. God, Jehovah God is our shepherd. Jehovah God is the one who protects us from the enemy. Jehovah God is the one who leads us in and out and brings us to green pastures and leads us beside the still waters. Who are you to suddenly come along and say, I am 
Lamb, the good shepherd. We look at that and we do not attach anywhere near the level of meaning that is actually attached to it when you understand it in the context of who Jesus was talking to and what was going on in their mind as they heard these words. Because Lord Jesus, you know what he was saying? He was just sitting there having a little conversation saying, I am God, 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 I am God. We're hearing, I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd laid down. We're hearing those words that Jesus was saying, I am God. I'm God, I'm God. Jehovah God, hello, how are you? I'm him. Yes, yes. And the Jews understood every word that he said. Yes, how dare this man suggest that he, they wouldn't even call Moses the good shepherd. Yes, right. And Moses led them out of the land of Egypt yes, into the land of Canaan and still they wouldn't call Moses no. Why? Because Moses wasn't leading. God was leading. There was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that led their way. God himself led the children of Israel. And the children of Israel would never deny that fact. No, Moses was following God. And we were following Moses, which is why the Apostle Paul made the declaration, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Christ. He was saying just like Moses, follow me, because I'm right behind Jesus. And Moses said, follow me, because I'm following the cloud. I'm following the pillar. I'm following God. He's doing the leading. Therefore, who was the shepherd that led Israel out of Egypt? It wasn't Moses. Hallelujah. It was God. And suddenly, Jesus stands and declares, I am the good shepherd. Hallelujah. Who glory. Folks, I told you, you'd have to be about half stupid not to understand that there's not hardly a word in this Bible that doesn't declare the identity of Jesus Christ. When Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, and the Bible tells us that his accuser said, he maketh himself to be God. This man says that he is God. Well, what's so surprising about that? That was a common claim by the leaders in Rome. Hello now. They believed that once you got up to the status of, you know, king and, and potentate over Rome, that you became a God man. So what's such a big deal about Jesus claiming to be God? Well, he didn't just say he was God or a God. He was saying that he was the God. Because in order to make the claim that you're the king of Israel, in the Old Testament, I've read it to you many times, in the Old Testament, God made it clear, I alone am king over Israel. When the people, when the people of Israel wanted a king, it offended God because he said, I am their king. Yes, amen. That's why he told the, uh, the priest in the Old Testament, don't be offended for my sake. He said, they haven't offended you, they've offended me. Yes. Said, I'm their king. And then when their king literally, physically showed up, they didn't know what to do with him. Yes, that's right. Because he wasn't going to do things the way they wanted him to. They wanted him to throw over Rome. And he said, no, I'm not interested in throwing over Rome. I'm interested in throwing over sin. Amen. I'm not interested in restoring uh, Jerusalem at this time. I'm not interested in restoring uh, the Jewish faith. I'm not interested in restoring the Hebrew nation. I'm interested in restoring Adam to everything that he lost in the garden. Amen. Y'all want me to look at the short term. I'm looking at the long term. I'm looking at what's important. I'm looking at eternity. And y'all are looking at what's in the here and now, right? In this exact minute. And because he would not pursue their goals and their desires, they would rather he be dead. Now 
listen, uh, Paul said, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of of Jesus Christ. So Paul there twice has stated, first of all he said that Jesus Christ is the image of God. No man hath seen God at any time. Well he's got to have an image to see him. Jesus Christ is that image. And Jesus said, you, he said, ever since you met me you've seen the Father and you know the Father. Because I am the very image of God. But listen, then he goes on to say that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. When you look into that man's face, you see everything that God is. All the glory of God. John chapter 1 verse 18, John the Apostle writes, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, or revealed him, shown him. John chapter 5 verses 37 through 43, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Well, what do you mean, Lord? You have neither heard his voice at any time. What about at the baptism? When the voice of God spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Y'all have heard me talk about this before. <clears throat> Who heard that statement? John did. The Bible said John bear record that he saw. John bear record that he heard. Yes, that's right. And hear the Lord speaking. Some of those people in John chapter 5 may very well have been there when he was baptized. But he said... You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his image, or his shape, I'm sorry. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Search the scriptures. You've heard me talk about this before too. Search the scriptures. When you read the word scriptures in the scriptures, it does not speak at all of the New Testament. It doesn't even begin to allude to the New Testament. It is speaking specifically of a body of work that existed in the uh, at that time that was known to the Hebrew people at that time as the Scriptures. And there is only one body of work that was called the Scriptures and that is what we today would refer to as the Old Testament. But listen to what Jesus said. Search the Scriptures for any in them ye think ye have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. He said if you look through your Old Testament and you read the Old Testament, if you go through from Genesis to Malachi, he said, baby, I've got news for you. The God you're reading about, the God that's being spoken of, the God that is name by name is the same man that stands before you now. He said the entire Old Testament canon speaks of me. Lord have mercy. Isn't it funny there's some who will tell you that God kept the fact he had a son secret until the New Testament was born. Because after all, according to them, the son is an eternally existing second person of the Trinity. But isn't it interesting that Jesus said, no, 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 read the Old Testament, it talks all about me. Yes, amen. <laughs> it talks all about, 
I mean, you can take an ignoramus off the street and hand them the Old Testament and let them read it, and I guarantee you, when they're all done, you ask them, now who is that talking about? Who is that whole uh, book speaking of? God. God. Yeah. Every minute of it's God. Yeah, right. Am I right? Yes. Uh-huh. And Jesus said, look at it again. <laughs> Look at it again. You think you've got eternal life. Look at it again. Because every word you read, I'm the one that's the subject. I'm the one that it's talking about. Funny, it did not one time mention the sun. Yes, that's right. Amen. Not one time does it allude to a son. It speaks of God. Jesus said, you know that whole book? Read it. And again, I have to say to you, if you were a Jewish listener, hearing him say this, you would immediately be drawing the conclusion that I have just shown you. Yes. That man says he's God. Yes, amen. Because the Old Testament don't talk about nobody but God. That's right. So this man is 